Easy mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the Optimizing the Trace Pro Optimization Process webinar. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be your moderator. This is Mike Govin. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for Lambda Research Corporation, and your presenter today is Dave Jacobson. He's our Senior Application Engineer. The format for today's seminar will be a 25 to 30 minute presentation, followed by a question and answer session. If at any time you wish to submit a question, please use the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Okay, Dave, go ahead. Yep. Okay. 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 Thanks, Mike. Um, and as Mike mentioned, uh, as we go through the webinar today, uh, if there's any questions you have, please feel free uh, type them into the question and answer box, and we will address all the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, and I'll try to remind you a few more times as we go along. Uh, just a, a couple quick notes before we get started. Uh, some additional resources if you're looking to learn more about TracePro. Uh, we have archived versions of all of our past webinars. Uh, these will include the audio and visual recordings uh, as well as the slides and any examples that were used during the webinars. Uh, those are available in the webinar section of our website. Uh, we also have video tutorials on different topics in TracePro on our site. Uh, there's printed or written tutorials, uh, as well as information on upcoming TracePro training classes is available on our website. Uh, the latest release of TracePro is TracePro 7.5.1, uh, released just about a week and a half ago, December 4th at, uh, on of 2014. And anybody that has current maintenance and support agreements can download that uh, new release right from the new releases section of our website. Uh, I mentioned training a slide or two ago. Our upcoming training sessions for TracePro, uh, we're having one at the University of Applied Sciences in Jena, Germany. Uh, it's going to be four days worth of training. We'll do two days on an introdu introduction to TracePro. Uh, then we'll have a day on optimization with TracePro. And then for our fourth day, we'll talk about stray light analysis using TracePro. Uh, towards the end of March, we will also be having training here in Littleton, Massachusetts at our headquarters. And we'll be doing, again, uh, two days on an introduction to TracePro, a day on optimization, a day on stray light analysis, and then also a day on the scheme macro language and programming. So anybody that's interested in any of these training sessions, please feel free to uh, drop us a note here. Uh, we'll be happy to send you additional information. Now, the agenda for today's webinar, we'll start with a quick, a quick, quick introduction. Uh, we'll talk about the need for an optimization process. Uh, we'll look at some of the theory and methods of optimization. Uh, then we'll get into the parameters and settings. and That's probably going to be most of the meat of today's webinar. Uh, we'll take a look at a hybrid system optimization example. Uh, basically with that one I want to show sometimes how the order of optimizing components can uh, lead to some differences in results. Uh, then we have some optimization tips at the end and finally a review and then some questions and answers. So at this webinar, what we want to do is, is look at the, the actual optimization process itself. Uh, not necessarily um, showing how to set up the optimizer, how to do, say, a reflector or a lens or a light guide in the optimizer. Uh, we have webinars on that already, and we're going to keep adding to that webinar base as well. But mainly today, I want to look at what's going on in the background and how you can make changes to the settings to improve your results. So uh, what is optimization? Uh, it's an act or a process or, or methodology of making something uh, such as a design or a system or a decision as fully perfect, functional, or effective as possible. Uh, this is from the, the Merriam-Webster online dictionary. And in our application, we're looking at using um, optical design software to optimize the shape of whether it's a lens or a reflector, a light guide. Um, and make it match the optimization requirements that we have. 
as a, a quick review, some of the things that we can optimize, uh, geometry, curvature, facets, position, angles, spacing, thickness. Uh, we can optimize properties. Uh, anybody interested in learning how to use the optimizer to optimize, say, a particular surface property or choose diffusers from a catalog? If you take a look at our May webinar, May of 2014 webinar uh, we did in conjunction with LED Professionals Magazine, uh, that talked about using the optimizer to scan through a series of properties in a catalog. So in, in terms of what a lot of people would like to see as far as optimization is they want to see an easy button on their computer. Or as our tech support manager likes to say sometimes, we'd like to see the, the make my system button. And really what we can hope to do with, with the optimization process is not necessarily that, but hopefully we can make it a bit easier. So the question is, could be, uh, why do you need an optimization process? Now, why can't we just do brute force? Why can't we go through and scan and try all different possibilities? Well, here's an example that does something similar to that. Uh, the goal here is to optimize this reflector to a given um, illumination pattern. And if I did this using the, well, here's my optimization goal, uh, uniform illumination across the central portion of the target and then tapering off towards the edges. So one way I could do this is to manually go through and try different combinations of the, the variable. Uh, in this case, there's only a single variable. It's right here, this control point, and it can move in the X, uh, sorry, in the Y and the Z directions. Uh, this dashed box here is the range that the variable can move. So the range of that variable is 40 millimeters in the y-axis and 100 millimeters in the z-axis. And if I was to scan that range of variables and say I picked an arbitrary increment of you know, 0.1 millimeter increments, that would take, it would be 41 times 101 um, increments or 4,141 um, 4,141 increments. Uh, if my ray trace time is one minute per iteration, which is relatively quick, that's going to take about 70 hours to complete uh, scanning through that range of variables. And I actually did use the, um, there's an option in the Trace Pro 3D Optimizer called Variable Scanning that will let me do just that, just this. It'll scan through in these 0.1 millimeter increments. And here's my optimization log after about 14 hours of ray tracing. I, I stopped it at that point. I mean, just see sort of a, a changing function here as it's scanning up and down through the variable. Uh, here we see the variable values 39 millimeters and 83, 84, 85, 86. So this is 39 in Y and then scanning up by one millimeter increments in X. Uh, so it takes a very long time to do it that way. Well, the other way is to use an optimization algorithm. Uh, in this case, this same, um, same reflector optimization took about two, two hours and 20 minutes. And I'm just going to play this video. I uh, used this video before, but this is the optimization process. Um, I recorded the screen. It, it's been sped up. Um, but the, the overall process took a little over two hours. And we can see the variable position changing as it goes through the process. Uh, we can also see it's starting to already um, optimize in and kind of localize on a point more towards the lower left corner um, of that, um, of that uh, variable range. I'll just let this run through to the end. It probably takes about another 30 seconds or so. We can already already see that it's it's not changing much. And if we look at our error function over here in the optimization log, we can see the error function is changing very little at this point. Uh, most of the change has happened uh, very early on in the process. 
And I'm actually going to stop this now. So it's, it's gone through almost 50 iterations here. So we can see we're looking at 70 hours with a brute force method versus 2 hours and 20 minutes uh, with an optimizer. And actually with this, this version here, I traced, I think, 10 times more rays for each iteration. Uh, compared to the brute force method. So I was able to trace more rays, get more accurate results. Let's talk a little bit then about the optimization theory and the methods. Uh, we'll talk about some general optimization and then we'll, we'll focus more specifically on the method used here in TracePro. And generally we have two types of optimizers, global and local. Uh, global optimizers will search through the entire solution space uh, to find the best solution based on the optimization goal um, or merit function. Uh, local optimizers are going to find the solution that's closest to the starting point um, of the optimization process. And changing the starting conditions can change the results of the optimization process. I have a few slides on just that. Uh, coming up here in a little bit where you can see the effect of changing the starting conditions and, and how it affects the answer. Uh, some examples of global optimization methods include uh, Global Explorer, Adaptive Simulated healing, Annealing, Global Synthesis, Hammer Optimization. In uh, these routines, these global optimization routines will generally have a function that allow them to escape from local solutions and sample more of the solution space in an attempt to find the best overall solution. Uh, for the most part, you're going to find optimization routines, these global optimizers, in uh, lens design programs such as Oslo. So if you're doing lens design, you, you would have access to these global optimizers. Uh, here's an example where a a global optimizer may be a good choice. This is a, a lithographic lens, probably about 25 to 30 elements. Uh, this is from Oslo. Now, local optimizers are a little bit different. Uh, and some of the, the methods uh, include damped least squares, Powell's method, uh, Nelder Mead, also known as downhill simplex, uh, or variable scanning. And the two we're going to talk about most here today uh, are the Nelder Mead and the variable scanning, uh, with most of the focus on Nelder Mead. Uh, for example, just the, the two examples I just showed, variable scanning was used to do that brute force method, and the Nelder Mead or downhill simplex was the, the methodology for the much faster way of getting there. Uh, local optimizers uh, don't have that escape function that I mentioned with global optimizers. And they'll tend to converge on the solution that's closest to the starting condition. Now, if you change those starting conditions, um, you can allow the optimization routine to sample more of the space and see if better solutions are available. And you're going to typically find local optimizers in illumination design programs uh, such as TracePro. Now here's an example of the solution space. Uh, we see it's, it's represented by this grid here. Uh, so all possible solutions from the problem would be contained in this space. And where we see these dips in the grid, they're actually uh, possible solutions um, for the problem. We have local minimum here. Uh, this deepest dip here, this would be the best solution. So in an ideal case, this is the solution we want to find. Well, the solution the optimizer will go to is really going to depend on the starting condition or starting position. So if we start over here in the right, well, then we're going to drop down most likely into that best solution. But starting over here or one of these other points, we may find a local solution before, uh, before we find that optimal solution. So this is a case where we can talk about moving around the starting condition, changing it to try to find better solutions. Now the, the main method of optimization in TracePro is the downhill simplex or Nelder-Mead uh, method. 
and it was pr proposed by John Melder and Roger Mead in 1965. Um, as I've mentioned, it's a local optimizer, and it will converge to the solution closest to the starting point. Uh, it's possible that a better solution is available, and changing the initial starting conditions can be used as a test to see if that better solution is available. Uh, this type of method is a good choice when optimizing geometry, position, rotation, uh, or other factors like that, where it's desirable to sort of jump around the solution space uh, and then refine that to get the best choices uh, for the variables, or the basically the variables being the, the positions or the, the shape of the geometry. And the Nelder Mead method uses the, comp the concept of a simplex, which is a, a special polytope of n plus 1 vertices in n dimensions. So some examples of simples, simplices include a line segment on a line, a triangle on a plane, and a tetrahedron in three-dimensional space. Now I mentioned the word, the word polytope above. Uh, a polytope is a geometric object with flat sides which, exi which exists in any general number of dimensions. So a polygon is a polytope in two dimensions, a polyhedron is in three dimensions, and so on in the higher dimensions, uh, such as a polychoron in four dimensions. And here's the example, here's some examples. Two variables is two dimensions and three vertices. It's a triangle. Uh, three variables is three dimensions and four vertices. So it's this pyramid or uh, tetrahedron type shape. So if we look at a, a simple example with two variables, and that, that example I showed initially with the reflector optimization has two variables. It's an X or a Y variable and a Z variable. Um, so for two variables, the simplex is a triangle. And then the algorithm compares the error function at each vertex. So it'll run three ray traces initially and look at the error function value at each vertex of that triangle. Uh, rejects the vertex where the error function is the highest and replaces it with a new vertex. Uh, this forms a new triangle and then the process is repeated. And this generates a sequence of triangles where the error function at the vertices gets smaller and smaller. Um, as a result, the size of the triangles is reduced and the local minimum is found. The methodology used for generating these new simplices is reflection, expansion, contraction, and shrinkage. And here's what that looks like. Um, here's the methods where we see reflection, we're reflecting. Here's our, our best, our worst, and our middle condition. So we're reflecting about this line here to form a new, uh, new simplex. Uh, then we'd test these this point here, compare it to these two, decide where to, what to do for the next one. Uh, the other options, expansion, contraction, and shrinkage. Just different ways it's using, uh, that the method uses to find um, where it should look for the next point. And if you actually want to keep track of that in TracePro, uh, in the optimization log, the trend chart shows what process was used to generate the next variable position. So we have gray is the initial simplex. Uh, in this case, there's 11 variables here. So here's the initial simplex. Then we have reflection, expansion, contraction, shrinkage. So we can see through the initial part of this process, it's mainly reflection and contraction going on. Some expansion here, and then some shrinkage, and then down to the final solution here. So the the optimization log, if you're interested, will let you see what choices are being made for determining um, that additional solution space. Now another method, and this is available in the 3D optimizer in TracePro, is the variable scanning method. And this can be used to scan or step through all possible variable combinations. Uh, one use of this is to define a range of variables that could then be used in the downhill simplex. Um, or for the example, oh, this is a slide from my previous presentation, but uh, our May webinar talks about using this method here 
the step through diffuser catalog properties. So I'd suggest going back to that um, webinar to take a look at how to do that. So some of the uses of variable scanning. Uh, scanning the range of a variable to find suitable starting condition for the downhill simplex method. Uh, moving a variable in fixed interval steps to monitor results. Uh, you could do tolerancing with this. Uh, you could also find the best surface or material property for a given application by automatically scanning through all properties. Uh, here's a the optimization log for scanning through diffuser properties. And we see the, the error function here. And the lowest error function was actually with the um, the fourth iteration here. So this would in this case this was our best. It's the third iteration. This is off by one here. So the diffuser th the third diffuser was actually the best result. And we could go back and apply that to the model and, and look at that. Another way of using this variable scanning method is tolerancing. And here's a lens with a, a nominal 25 millimeter radius of curvature, and it's coupled to a, a detector. And if we wanted to see what's the effect of changing that radius of curvature, say due to manufacturing tolerances, well, how does that coupling efficiency change? And we can see here, as the radius increases, uh, the efficiency falls off very rapidly. Uh, not quite so much if the radius of uh, curvature decreases. So again, we could look at the effect of changing that um, or manufacturing tolerances, what they may have on the results using this variable scanning method. Well, now I want to talk a bit about the, the optimization parameters and settings in TracePro, in the optimizers, and how you can set those up. Uh, there's three main things we can look at for parameters and settings. That's variables, uh, optimization operands, and optimization settings. So variables are, are the parts you're going to allow to move during the process. Uh, the optimization operand is the goal, what's your target. And then the settings are, are what's used during the, the optimization process to generate the, the actual optimized result. So just a quick review on some of these here. Uh, variables are the parameters that are allowed to change during the optimization process. Uh, they can include the control point position in one, two, or three dimensions, curvature, conic constant, rotational angle, distance, separation, pickups, custom, or user-defined. Uh, and when the variable is defined, the, the range of the variable is specified. And the range is, is how much that variable is allowed to move during the process. Um, the, the range of the variable could also be used to set um, or limit the, the size of the, the element itself. If you were designing a reflector and you wanted a fixed 50 millimeter width, well, you could set your variable so the, the reflector is exactly 50 millimeters or it never gets larger than 50 millimeters in diameter. And the variables can be absolute relative or pickups. Uh, absolute variables are defined using absolute or global coordinates for the range of motion. Um, if the original variable's location is then changed, the range stays fixed. Uh, relative variables are defined relative to the current location of the variable. So if you move the variable, the range moves with it. And then pickups allow you to define the position and movement of a variable based on another value of another, or the value of another variable. Uh, for example, a variable can specify as a pickup to maintain a constant thickness in material uh, or a specific separation between two components. And just here's some, some graphical examples of that. Uh, the top here is the initial design, and on the left it's a relative variable. So you can see as I, if that variable position is moved, the range of it moved with it. So now it, it's moved more down here to the lower right. In this case, the variable is defined as an absolute variable. As I move that position down to the lower right corner, the range of that variable stays fixed in position. 
uh, and a couple examples of pickups. Uh, in this case, a pickup variable is used to make both sides of this lens have the same radius of curvature, just opposite signs. Um, you could also use it to maintain a constant spacing between two elements, say in this uh, doublet lens. Another use, and the way I've been using it here in this, exa this example for this webinar, is to maintain a constant wall thickness on this reflector. So this inside variable, the one that is actually moving, and the outside one here that's in green is linked to that, so it's always, I believe, two millimeters away from it. So it always maintains a constant two millimeter wall thickness. Now, one question that comes up fairly often with variables is how many variables to use during the optimization process? And it, there's no exact answer to this, uh, and sometimes it comes with just a little bit of experience. But here's an example of reflector, and there's only a single variable to find here. This point here can move left or right, and that's it. Uh, in this case, there's really not enough variables defined to do the job. Um, here's the resulting reflector. It's the same optimization goal as previous with a relatively uniform illumination through the central portion of the target. We can also see here that the optimization process finished relatively quickly. You know, after about 10 iterations, it was right around the, the, the final answer. Now going in the other direction, we could define too many variables. And here's that same reflector profile, but now defined with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 variables. Well, we can see one consequence, that the optimization process took much longer, uh, 350 iterations when it was stopped. But the other consequence of that is you could wind up with an unmanufacturable design. And we see here it, it meets the, the goal pretty well. Uh, it's unif uniform illumination across the central portion here. You could probably trace more rays to smooth this out. But if we look at the profile here, uh, something that really wouldn't be able to be um, manufactured. And then here's that same example using just two variables. We can see the optimization process, about 100 iterations. And well, not quite as good as the, the previous one, the, the results are pretty close to where we'd want to be, uh, relatively uniform illumination across the central portion of the target, and a, a manufacturable reflector profile. Uh, some of the optimization operands, and again, these are the the targets that we can use for the, the goal of the optimization process, things like flux, CIE coordinates, irradiance, irradiance profiles, intensity, uh, candela or intensity profiles, uniformity, beam width. Uh, there's also an option for a user to find or custom uh, targets. And again, if you go back to some of our previous webinars where we actually uh, do some examples of optimization, you can see these different, um, these different operands in use. I mentioned previously when we were talking about the optimization process, the, the Nelder Mead, how varying the initial starting point um, can help you see if there's better solutions available. So here's the initial design, here's the optimization goal. And I ran it five times. And in each case, I varied the starting position um, of the optimization. And my variable range didn't change, so this is a use of an absolute variable. But I started it in the center, upper, upper left, lower left, upper right, and lower right corners of the variable range. And we can see the results here. Um, again, upper left, lower left, center, upper right, lower right. Um, we get three very different reflect, or sorry, five very different reflector shapes. If we look at the irradiance maps of those resulting uh, reflector shapes, well, you can see some of them are fairly close. Um, this, this one here starting the lower right has a nice uniform illumination, 
but the efficiency of the system is only 24 percent compared to the center condition is about 60 percent so quite a bit more light here in the center but we have these this sort of structure to it uh, so we could look at some different you know these three conditions here are re relatively more similar within you know 40 to 50 percent efficiency now you can improve those results by say adding a second optimization target for example initially the optimization target was just uniformity uh, then the in a second case we could add in in addition to uniformity or the profile we could say we want to have a target goal of 750 lumens and then we can weight those oper those operands so that the contribution of each uh, can be varied uh, and in this case they were set to be similar contributions to the overall error function and here's the initial result after with one target here it is after adding a second target and we can see we went from 24 percent here now our uh, our flux our, our efficiency is up to 71 percent a little bit of structure probably adding a diffuser in this or maybe changing the reflector material would smooth that out even more and then to dig into the the optimization settings uh, and these are used to control how the optimization process runs. And changes in these settings can sometimes result in improvements in the final design. Um, they can also, if you make the wrong choices, they can lead to poor results. And some examples of the optimization settings that can be varied. Uh, optimization type, the characteristic length, stopping conditions, uh, number of rays traced, and also, this really isn't a setting, but it does play a key role, the, the accuracy of the source model. So for the optimization method, well, choose the one that best suits the application. Uh, if you're doing uh, optimizing geometry or position, uh, the downhill simplex or Nelder Mead method is going to be the way to go. Now one function in the optimization process is what's called the characteristic length and this is set in the configuration button for the 3d optimizer and the characteristic length is the estimate of the size of the solution space for the optimization process and it's used when you def in defining that initial simplex and each vertex of the initial simplex is a variable set. Uh, it's a function of the characteristic length and a random number. And if you remember when I mentioned about the, uh, say, a simple simplex with just being a triangle, well, changing the characteristic length will change the size of that triangle uh, and how much of the space is sampled for the initial uh, part of the process only. Uh, once you get past the initial simplex, the, uh, the downhill simplex method actually controls uh, the size of the, the, ra the variable range being sampled, the uh, simplices. So here's an example of that. Uh, this blue box is the variable range. And I set the characteristic length to be 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, 200, and 500. And we can see the size of those initial simplices and how they change. Uh, some of these are quite small and really can't be seen in this graph, but for example, this orange one is the characteristic length is 200. This light blue is with 500. This one's with 100. Um, so changing that characteristic length changes that initial sample size. Just as a, as a sort of a demonstration of what's happening, uh, here are the the simplexes and the different variables that are tried out through the first 12 iterations of a process. This is with two variables and I'll scan in here and we can see we start here and then it's just these series of triangles that are formed and when I stop the process after 12 iterations here is where the ending point was. So just graphing out the, the variables as they're, um, as they're going along. 
Uh, changing that characteristic length can also change the, the results. So here we see those same increments, 0.1 up to 500, and the resulting reflector shapes that come from that. Again, same, same design, same starting point in each case, only changing the characteristic length uh, for the process. And then the irradiance maps for those, each one. Then the stopping conditions. Uh, can also determine, or these are what determines when the process is finished or complete. Uh, some of the possible ones that can be included, uh, if the goal is reached, no, the process will stop, um, or the number of iterations. Uh, in this one, you can define when to stop after a, you know, set a user-defined number of iterations. When it hits that point, it stops. And then the most... Um, the normal one that's used is the iteration tolerance. And basically this will determine, it'll look from one iteration to the next, and when the variation from one to the next drops below a certain level, uh, the optimization process will stop. That means that there's very little change happening with each iteration. Uh, another thing that can really affect that optimization results is the number of rays you're tracing. Uh, you need to make sure you're tracing enough rays uh, to get an accurate result. Uh, in this case, this is in the irradiance or illuminance map. Uh, if you trace too few rays, uh, the graphs can be noisy and the results will be difficult for the optimizer to interpret. So, for example, in this example on the left, there's only 3,000 rays traced and trying to determine is there uniform light through through any portion of this target would be difficult. Um, here's 300,000 rays traced and here's 3 million rays. Now we can see obviously 3 million rays looks the best. Uh, the 300,000 may work as, just as well and would actually lead to a faster optimization time because the um, because the process runs quicker. The, the main time factor in the optimization process is how long it takes to run the ray trace. And then uh, last thing under what I'm considering optimization parameters and settings would be having an accurate source model. Uh, and it's important to have the source model that's accurate as possible. Uh, these can include ray files, source, uh, surface source properties, uh, full 3D model of the source, and basically a bad source model is going to lead to poor results. And some of the factors to consider, size, shape, angular distribution, spatial distribution, spectrum, color, the number of rays if you're using a ray file. And we, we do have numerous webinars on our website on modeling sources. So if you want to see a little more about some of the, the ways you can accurately model sources in TracePro, I suggest taking a look at that. Uh, here's an example of where a bad source model could lead to inaccurate results. On the top example is a, a TIR hybrid lens, and it was modeled with a, a point source. Uh, another example of this would be if you used an IES file for a, a light source, for an LED, where all the rays are coming from a single point. And we see here we have an intensity of about 440 watts per steradian. Down below, this is using a ray file for this LED. It's an Osram LED, if I remember correctly. And now we see that the actual intensity would be about 91 watts per steradian. So if you design this lens using a point source and we're expecting over 400 watts per steradian, and when you actually plug the LED in, you're going to get less than one quarter that, that output. So it's important to have a good and accurate source um, source and the model in TracePro itself before you start the optimization process. I have to kind of just wrap this up and take a look at a quick example and then we'll get to some optimization tips as well. But I want to look quickly here at a, a hybrid system. And what I mean by a hybrid system is a system that's using both a lens and a reflector. And the goal in this case is to optimize the shape of a side emitting LED lens so we're trying to make all the light come out of the side of this lens and the reflector. 
Now there's two ways we could do this. Um, the first way I'll show is we could optimize the lens first and then the reflector. Uh, the second one would be to optimize the lens and reflector as one combined system. And we can see that we'll see slightly different results. So here's the, the setup for this side emitting lens and the goal is to have all the light coming out of the sides here and as little as possible going straight forward. Uh, the optimization goal is a candela target for that. Uh, and then here's the optimization log and here's the candela plot before and after. Uh, it did suppress some of this move the light into the, the 80 degree angles that I, was, that I was aiming for. There's still a little bit of light leaking through in the center, so we'd probably want to go back and rework the design a little bit. But now what I would do is I would take that lens and I would add a reflector to it. Here's the reflector optimization setup. And not changing the lens in this case, you're going to use that fixed lens design. Uh, this is a faceted reflector, and my goal is uh, a plus or minus 20, 20 degree target or 20 degree beam falling to zero at 25 degrees through the optimization log. And here's the result. Here's the initial before optimization, and here it is after. Now one thing we'd see our candela or an intensity has gone up quite a bit. And our beam is 20 degrees. It, it's got a little bit of fall off here that it's not falling off quite as much as I'd like initially. So we, again, we go back, make some changes to see if we can improve that. And then here's my before and after for the reflector shape. Now another way you could possibly do this um, is, would be to optimize the lens and the reflector uh, as a system which case we'll set both of these to vary at the same time. Here's our lens in the center. Here's our reflector. Uh, the goal is going to be the same as what the reflector was now, which is a, a uniform candela profile, plus or minus 20 degrees. And here's the result. Uh, our intensity is a little bit lower than what we got optimizing separate. At that time we got 2.1 candela. Uh, this is 1.7, and it's got a dip here in the center. Uh, but it's still, it's roughly that 20-degree uh, beam, what we were looking for. Uh, the reflector shape is a, a little, possibly a little easier to manufacture, but um, so it does have a different reflector shape. But here's the results of the two. Here's the separate optimization, and here's the combined and in this case, I think we have better results with the separate. It's a little smoother distribution here across the center. We wouldn't necessarily have this little hole uh, in the middle of the pattern. And here's the two reflector shapes side by side. Now, one difference was I looked at these two reflectors, and, and here's the view of those two, looking straight on into the two of them, and using the, the photorealistic rendering tool in Trace Pro. We can see here, when we looked at the combined, you know, optimizing both the reflector and the lens at the same time, we have a pretty good bright spot right in the center with this bright ring around it. Whereas looking here, looking back at the LED, it's much smaller, much dimmer, and the light is spread out over a much larger area. So it won't be as obtrusive or as glary if you're looking back into it. So in this case, doing that, as a separate optimization actually results um, in the better, uh, the better answer, even though it may take a little bit longer because you optimize the lens, then you optimize the reflector. So to, to wrap this up, and once again, I'll remind everybody, we do already have some questions coming in. Uh, please feel free to type in any questions you have uh, in the question uh, panel for the, for the GoToWebinar control box. But just to, to kind of wrap up with some tips for the optimization process. Uh, one thing is it's always good to try to start with as good of an initial design as possible. 
uh, make the optimizer's job a little bit easier. Uh, use accurate models, including your geometry and your properties. Uh, use accurate source models. Uh, and define enough variables so that the model is not over or under constrained. Uh, set your characteristic length to adequately, adequately sample the solution space. Uh, you want to try to define achievable optimization operands or goals. Uh, these are the, you know, if your source is only putting out one, you know, 100 lumens and you're setting your goal at 700 lumens, well, it's never going to get there and it, it could stop the optimization process prematurely. Uh, trace enough rays so that the analysis maps are not noisy and the optimizer can make accurate decisions. Uh, that's, that's good practice for any model in TracePro, whether you're optimizing or not. Uh, change some of the optimization parameters to, to check for better solutions. Uh, and then lastly, this, this applies not just to TracePro, but to, to all you know, optical analysis and softwares, is know the capabilities of the software and the optimization program. What can and can't it do? Okay, so just a quick summary. Um, Software-based optimization allows you to, to easily search a large range of solution to find the best results for a given problem. Uh, you can shorten that design process considerably. Um, you can virtually test these designs, you know, cutting down the need for physical pro prototypes. Uh, you can search a large number of solutions in a short period of time. Uh, in addition to, to geometric optimization, which is what most people think of first, when you talk about optimization. You can also optimize position or, or aiming or rotational angle or properties. Uh, and you can also do tolerancing. Uh, and for anybody that, that's uh, listening today or in the future, uh, if you'd like to try TracePro for, uh, for 30 days for free, we do have a free, free trial available on our, our website, uh, www.lambdares.com, or you can also reach us at the contact numbers below. Um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and have Mike and uh, Gary come back on if they'd like. Yes, I'm back, uh, Dave. Okay. And yes, we have quite a few questions. Okay. Uh, the first question uh, is how illumination profile function is evaluated. Is it absolutely or relatively evaluated? It is evaluated using... Um, it's the Pearson's method, I believe, is the way of evaluating it. And one way to look at it is if you if you looked at the profile option in the irradiance map, um, it's comparing that to the um, to the illumination target that you set, the illumination or the irradiance profile you set in the optimizer. So it, it's looking along the length of that, whether it's a horizontal or vertical uh, slice of the irradiance map, and then comparing that to the to the goal. So it's done. Um, I guess you could say it is relative. It's sort of it's it's doing the um, looking at the relative uh, irradiance and comparing it to the to the target. Our next question is how uh, the Trace Pro manual has very little content on the optimizer. What is the best source for technical reference on the optimizer so that it can actually be used? Uh, the two best resources I'd say one is the webinars that we have. Uh, we've done webinars on using the optimizer for for light guides and reflectors. Uh, there's also webinars on looking at things like changing the properties. Uh, and a lot of those have examples included as well. Uh, and there's also the online help in the optimizer. So if you go to the help, uh, click help in the manual, uh, I mean, sorry, help in the menu bar of the optimizer, that'll also uh, bring you to a searchable help document. Our next question, what angle resolution is used for the Candela profile error function? I believe it's going to use the angular setup or the number of points that you define in the Candela plot. So before you actually run the optimization, if you run a ray trace, set up your Candela plot so that you, you have your normal and up vectors set correctly. But then you can also define the, the number of points uh, that's what it should be looking for, but I can double check on that. Our next question is, how is the flux operand evaluated, absolutely or relatively? Uh, flux is evaluated absolutely. 
So when you define a flux target, uh, say your target was, the example I used earlier here was 750 lumens, you'd enter in, in the optimization um, operands, you'd choose flux, you'd choose the surface you want to look at that flux on, and then for a target, you'd set 750. And then the optimization, the error function is based on comparing the flux on that target after the ray trace compared to the, the, the desired flux or the target flux. Next question is, the stopping conditions don't work for me. Number as well as the goal limit deviation. Do you have any idea why that's being a problem? I, I tried this. I, I remember this question um, after the, the last training I did over in Belgium. Uh, I did try that, and I'll take another look at it. Uh, and get back to them, but it did work for me, you know, the number of conditions, uh, but I will drop the, the user a note, and we'll see if we can figure out what's happening there. I haven't seen that problem as well. Yeah. Uh, my next question, for a better solution, could I use the result of the first local optimization as the starting point for a subsequent one? Yes. Uh, basically, when you reach the, the end of the optimization process, you could save that result uh, but then you could go back in, you could use that as a new starting condition, uh, you could change parameters, you could change you know, the variable range if you wanted to, uh, but you could absolutely do that in a series of steps. Um, Jerry's asking another question here. What average density of rays per pixel of the illumination map goal is recommended? Uh, I usually, it, it's hard to, to get you know, a number of rays per pixel, but um, I usually would like to see at least five to ten rays for every pixel. Does that sound similar to your experience, Mike? Yes, very much so. I, I usually look for around eight per pixel, and sometimes when you have a lot of power in the uh, the middle of the map, you might have to trace even a, a lot more rays because you, if you're looking for an artifact or some type of, of problem in the, the irradiance map, you want to see it, and so you're going to have to spend a, a little bit more time waiting for those rays to trace. Uh, our, next, uh, our next question is a big thank you from Renee, and I have to uh, thank you as well, Dave. That was an excellent talk, and uh, thank you for putting that together. Thank you. Uh, Marcus is asking, um, hello, is the uniform illumination example available as a file? Um, I don't have it available right now, but I can uh, certainly send that out. Uh, what I'll do is I will we'll, we'll put that up as an example uh, when we post the webinar on the website. So I'll, I'll give you that, Mike, if you want to add that into the examples portion. Sounds so good. Within a, probably by tomorrow, uh, we'll have this, a recording of this. And I forgot to mention that uh, we are recording this webinar, so we will put um, a copy of this on our website uh, along with the slides. And, and I'll add that example in as well, both the, the Trace Pro model and the, um, the properties and the uh, optimizer file. Uh, the next question from Jerry is, can I combine illuminance goal with flux goal? When is evaluated relatively in the flux absolutely? Uh, you can combine uh, illumination and flux. Uh, you can add as many operands as you want. So for illumin illuminance, you could define whether you're defining a specific illuminance value. Uh, if you pick, say, uh, it would actually, I think, be listed as irradiance in the optimizer. But if you picked irradiance, you could specify a specific irradiance target, say, um, and whether it's, whether it's in photometric or radiometric will vary depending on how TracePro is set. But you could define an irradiance of, say, 150 lux, um, as well as, you know, 200 lumens on the target. So you could set those both um, that way. Jacob has another question for us. How to switch an irradiance target profile definer to degrees? You cannot. Uh, the irradiance target is always going to be defined based on the irradiance map. Uh, if you want to go to a to degrees, you could be using a, you could choose a candela profile as a target. Um, the other option would be to look at your target size and calculate how many degrees it subtends and enter that value in, say, put a uniform distribution for a candela target in uh, based on that. So the, the irradiance target is always going to use the dimensions, the, the X and Y or Y and Z dimensions of the, 
um, irradiance map in degrees would be in the candela target. Scott has a question here. When optimizing a hybrid reflector plus lens TIR collimator, how would you adapt the optimization process to the fact that the main reflector is no longer a single curved axial aligned with the desired beam direction? Uh, so basically an asymmetric type reflector, I'm thinking. Um, you could do that. I mean, this example was rotationally symmetric, but the 3D optimizer allows you to do um, freeform and asymmetric shapes, iconic type reflectors. So what I would do in that case is I'd just choose a different um, a different surface type and a different object type for the reflector and, and basically make it uh, that shape. So you, you could certainly do something that's, that's non-rotationally symmetric. And our final question from Janos is, are you planning to provide a scheme scripting version of your optimizer? Well, the optimizer does already provide for, for using uh, scheme macros uh, as part of the optimization process. Uh, that's actually what's happening in the background. Uh, you do have the ability to add macro commands to the optimizer and run macro code right in it. Um, when you're in the optimization window, there's a, a box marked after scheme, and you can enter in scheme macro commands there. Uh, so yes, certainly, uh, certainly that is an option. Uh, the webinar we did about a year or two ago on the scheme macro language shows some examples uh, of that, as well as the the webinar from this past May on the optimizing the LED uh, luminaire talks a bit about that as well. So certainly there, and when we do the optimization training, um, we could we do a, a section on that as well. Oh, looks like another question came in. Right, Janos is asking. Uh, thank you. Uh, could we set an other? Uh, can we set another optimization mirror function? Uh, you can set. There is the option for for user defined um, merit functions, or uh, where basically you can define your own um, in addition to the ones that are that are pre-programmed into the software. And if you go into the help section for the 3D optimizer, there is some information on user defined. Uh, operands. I'll put out, I guess, one last call for questions. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, I'll be happy to address them at this point. Uh, also, feel free to, if, you, if there are some questions um, that come up after this webinar ends, please feel free to, to send them in to us and we'll be, we'll be happy to address them. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more, so I'm going to say that uh, we should probably wrap this up. And Dave, thanks once again for putting this webinar together, and I'm sure that uh, we can address your questions if you just send them into sales at lambdares.com if you have further questions on this webinar. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike, and thanks for everybody for attending, and we ho hope everybody has uh, happy holidays, and we look forward to seeing you at the new, in the new year at our next webinar. Have a good day.